Psalm 132, verses 1 through 10. O Lord, remember David and all the hardships he endured. He swore an oath to the Lord and made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will allow no sleep to my eyes, no slumber to my eyelids, till I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. We heard it in Ephrathah. We came upon it in the fields of Jar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priests be clothed with righteousness. May your saints sing for joy. For the sake of David, your servant, do not reject your anointed one. Amen. Let's pray, please. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this, your holy word. Thank you for this message and these people who are here to receive it. Father, may you anoint us all, Lord, with your wisdom and your patience and your understanding. May the Spirit give us, your Spirit give us, Lord, Lord, our eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for us this day. May, Lord, this be pleasing to you in all that is said and done. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Covenant. Covenant. Psalm 132 is the longest psalm of the Psalms of Ascent. Psalm 132 has 18 verses. Now, we only read the first 10 verses, so I'd like to read the rest of them. If you would, please follow along as I read verses 11 through 18. The Lord swore an oath to David, a sure oath that he will not revoke. One of your own descendants I will place on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and the statutes I teach them, then their sons will sit on your throne forever and ever. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling. This is my resting place forever and ever. Here I will sit enthroned, for I have desired it. I will bless her with abundant provisions. Her poor will I satisfy with food. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints will ever sing for joy. Here I will make a horn grow for David and set up a lamp for my anointed one. And I will close his enemies with shame, but the crown on his head will be replentant. Amen. You know, Psalm 132, as you may have guessed by right now, can be easily divided into two sections, verses 1 through 10 and 11 through 18. In the first section, we have David's vow and his prayer to the Lord. And in the second section, we have the Lord's oath and his answer to David's prayer. On the surface, this psalm sort of reads a little complicated, but it's the It's the only one that mentions King David and and the events from Israel's history with any really detail. So just what is this psalm all about? Well, simply put, it appears to be about making vows and oaths. And we see here in verse 2 that David swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. We see in verse 11 that the Lord swore to David. A sure oath from which he will not turn back. The fact that David is making a vow to the Lord and that the Lord is swearing an oath to David in returns certainly says something about the relationship that they share together. Doesn't it? In one, it is one that includes responsibilities and obligations and, and promises and blessings. So, What does this psalm have to do with us? Well, at the heart of this psalm is something that that lies in the heart of our relationship to God too. God has chosen us, or he's chosen to relate to us the idea of a covenant. So that's what Psalm 132 is really all about. It's about covenants. It's the thought of covenants that I want to focus on this morning. 
So first we have covenants. What is a covenant? You know, lots of people uh, lump the idea of a covenant with the same idea as a contract. But in reality, the two ideas, even though they are similar, they are very, very different. They are different especially when it comes to the kind of relationship that they each envision. Let me explain. In a contract, the underlying principle is for the individual, for the individualistic, basically. You make a contract with someone else so that your life will benefit. We make a contract so we'll get benefits, right? I'm not going to make a contract. If I don't get any benefit from it, why do I sign the contract? So we do it to get benefit. In other words, you form a contract out of such questions as like, how would this benefit me? Or how would this improve my life? Or how can I get this if I, how can I get out of it if I need to? We actually look at contracts. Most contracts is actually have um, clauses in it to where you can exit the contract. How do I get out of the contract? A contract can be broken. The kind of relationship envisioned in a contract is completely practical and it's based on my needs and the other person usually is an e a means to an end. That's why we do a contract, right? We do a contract with someone and we do it because that other person becomes a, a means to an end. And some people, unfortunately, they see marriage as a contract. That's why so many marriages today end in disaster. What kind of relationship is envisioned when an engaged couple actually has a prenuptial contract? That tells me that they already figured they're going to split up sometime in the future or that they're headed down the wrong road. If a couple enters a marriage with this attitude, how much hope? Really, how much hope can we have for them to last forever? But a covenant now is something that's different. A covenant creates a new state of relationship. A covenant is about our willingness to enter fully into a relationship with someone else. It's not self-centered. It's other-centered. Like in our psalm, a covenant includes a promise. We make vows. We make oaths. And in fact, a marriage, they make vows. That's why a marriage really ought to be seen as a covenant and not a contract. We don't enter a marriage just for our own benefit. If we do, we got a big surprise coming. We also... We're there for the other person. We're there for them. You might say that a contract is about convenience, whereas a covenant is about commitment. And that's how I counsel young people who are thinking about getting married. I tell them, you're making a commitment. You're not making a contract. It's not equal. It's a commitment. Now let's think about God's covenant for a second. Covenants were widespread in the ancient world. And it was a pact both between parties to agree to honor each other. A covenant signifies a relationship based on a commitment. It includes promises and it also in, uh, includes obligations. It has a quality of reliability and durability. When we look at the, the biblical understanding, much of this is the same. One scholar describes it this way. He says a covenant expresses a novel element of the religion of ancient Israel. The people are bound in relationship to the one God, Yahweh, who makes an exclusive claim upon their loyalty and worship and their social life. And they express uh, God's gracious commitment and faithfulness and thus establish a continuing relationship. Now, 
basically what he's saying here, this is a common form of agreement culturally, but it was novel or is actually very unique to the relationship of Israel. The religion of Israel was their relationship with God, the one true God. They had a covenant with God. No other a religion, no one else could claim a relationship with their God which was based on a covenant. Only Israel could do so. So when we read the Bible, we can see that God has made several covenants throughout history. He made a covenant with Noah that he would never flood the earth again and destroy all life. He made a covenant with Abraham to bless him and make him a great nation and give him many descendants. He made a covenant with Moses in the form of the law. He made a covenant with David that there would always be a descendant of David's on the throne of Israel. And all of these covenants tell us at least two things. First, Of all the covenants, all of the covenants are rooted in God's character. While in the ancient world, most covenants were made between equal parties. Obviously, this is not the case when it comes to making a covenant between God and his people. The covenants that God established are never based on the merit of of the other party. Let me explain that. As Psalm 132, 13 says, For the Lord has chosen Zion. The Lord chose Zion. They didn't choose him. He chose them. God has chosen to covenant with Israel. God has chosen to establish his relationship. He chose. God has promised to bless his people. The covenants of God are based completely on God's graciousness and his choice of Israel, not the other way around. He's the one that chose them. He's the one that picked Abraham. He's the one that picked Israel, the people. The covenants are based on who God is and not who we are. Obviously, the the covenant was not based on who Israel was. God establishes these covenants as a demonstration of his character so that all the peoples who were not chosen and who could watch Israel and they would stand up and they would take notice of the sort of God that they worshipped. Between you and me, I wouldn't have picked Israel. If I was God, then you probably wouldn't have either. Secondly, All of the covenants show God's unconditional commitment to his people. Now, you may need to understand this. This is a little rough. Because while God's people have responsibilities and commitments, such covenants that God makes are really not conditional. And I'm going to try to explain this. There are certainly obligations laid upon Israel. There were obligations. God made obligations for Israel. Israel must worship the God, uh, uh, mighty God alone, the Lord alone, and be loyal to him in every part of their lives. Israel must be God's witnesses to all the nations around them. However, at the heart of the covenants, they're not based on Israel's response to God, even though there are certain things that are certainly expected and even demanded from Israel. His covenant with them was not based on them being perfect and obedient and doing everything God told them to do. The covenants of God are based completely on his graciousness and upon his sovereign choice of Israel. He chose Israel. Do you think that he did not know that Israel would turn on him? Do you think that he did not know that they would fail him? Do you think God Almighty didn't know all this? And still he chose Israel. 
so his choice, his covenant, is based on his graciousness. And the fact that he's God Almighty, he can choose whoever he wants. And he chose Israel. You see, God's covenants are never, strictly speaking, conditional. But Israel was obligated to God because of his grace. God makes it clear that he will remove his blessings if Israel is disobedient. He removes his blessings. Deuteronomy 28, 15 says, But if you will not obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all his commandments and decrees, which I am commanding you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. But he will never... He will never reject Israel or withdraw his loving commitment. By God's grace, he chose Israel. God will certainly punish, but only will he punish because of a result of his love for Israel, not because he abandons Israel. When God removes his blessings from Israel, it's not a sign of his rejection. In fact, it's hard for some people to believe this, but to me, it's a sign just the opposite. This comes down again to the difference between a contract and a covenant. Remember, I told you they're different? The Lord did not establish a contract with Israel or with the church. God doesn't have a contract with us as a church. He created a covenant. And a covenant is not broken when one of the parties fail to keep their promise. Are you starting to see the difference between a covenant and a contract now? For example, if a patient... And I'm going to use this uh, as an example because so many of us have to go to the doctor so often. You'll have a good understanding of this. If a patient, for example, fails to keep your appointment at the doctor's office, the doctor don't say, well, where is Mr. and Mrs.? Oh, they're not here. Someone call them at home and find out why they're not here. That's not the way they do it. He just simply goes on to what? His next patient. And he has his appointment secretary say, hey, take note that those people didn't show up for their appointment. You see, he broke an informal contract, didn't he? However, according to God's word in Isaiah 49, 15, the Lord asked this. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even these may forget Yet I will never forget you. The Bible indicates that the ties, the covenant, is more like the ties of a mother to her child than the doctor to his patients. If a child fails to show up for dinner, do the parents just keep on eating and ignoring the fact that the child's not there? No, the, the parent has an obligation, unlike the doctors, which is canceled. But this is not canceled, right? The, the parent finds out where the child is and makes sure, especially Korean ladies, y'all make sure everybody's fed, right? If they're not at the dinner table, don't you try to find out where the child is at and make sure they have food? One member fails does not destroy the relationship. A covenant puts no conditions on faithfulness. It is the unconditional commitment to love and to serve. I wonder how many people today see God as a contract God. A lot of people do. They look at God, they think he's a contract God. They think that if they live up, 
If they live up to their end of the bargain, then they will get into heaven. If I can just be a good enough person, then I'll get into heaven. How many people believe that because they're not living lives pleasing to God, that there's no way they could even not only be Christian, but they can't even come to church because they're not good enough? People think that way. How many people think that they have to clean themselves up and be good before they can come to church? How many people think that God has a contract with each one of us that says if you're good and don't do too many things in the course of your life, then I'll let you go to heaven when you die. You might be surprised. There's a lot of people who think that way and unfortunately, even some of you might be a little concerned that that's the relationship we have with God. Thank God that's not what I have with God because I'm never going to be good enough. I don't have a contract with God. I have a covenant. We do not have a contracted God. We have a covenant God, and he established the relationship with us based on who he is. Not on who we are. This means that our relationship with God is certainly based on nothing more or less than His grace. He chose us. It's His, His steadfast and unconditional love that we could never hope to earn. Or merit. There's no way we can earn the love of God. There's no way we can be good enough to deserve to go to heaven. There's nothing we can do but accept His grace. Nowhere do we see this more clearly than at the cross of Jesus Christ. Only there can we see God's grace. And that was the new covenant. We all know enough of the Old Testament story to know that God's people never did live up to their side of the covenant, did they? They never did. There were times and periods that when they were better than other times, but on the whole, the story of Israel is a story of people who were in rebellion against God. The very God that chose them, the very God that loved them, the covenant God, yet they could not follow Him and Him alone. Yet God never gave up on them, He persisted. God continued in his faithfulness. He continued to be merciful both in promise and in judgment. Even though Israel didn't, he did. He lived up to his side of the covenant. If you have your Bible still, I hope you do, turn in your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31 Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. I want to read. Follow along as I read, please. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 says, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Oh, praise the Lord. And I will not be like the covenant. It will not be like the covenant I made with your forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their mind and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God. And they will be my people. And no longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more.
You know, so God, God promised to make a new covenant with us, one that would be written on the hearts of his people. And Psalm 132, uh, 11 says, The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not revoke. Even if we have not kept our promises, as God's people, God keeps his covenants. He keeps his promises. Even though we fail God, he never fails us. God surely keeps all of his promises. And his promises were kept for us in Jesus Christ. And Christ alone is the culmination and the fulfillment of all the promises that God has ever made. Every covenant of God finds its meaning and completion in Jesus Christ. God promised Noah that he would never again destroy all life. Jesus is a source of all life. God promised Abraham that all nations would be blessed through him. Through Jesus' blood, God ransomed saints from every tribe, every nation, every language, and every people. God gave Moses and Israel the law. In Jesus, the law is fulfilled. In our psalm, God promised David that one of the sons of your body, I will sit on your throne. God gave Jesus the throne of his ancestor David. Every promise, every vow, every oath, and every pledge that God has ever made has come true in our Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone. And they came true in Jesus because he was willing to go to the cross in our place. The need for sacrifice is also part of the covenant that God has made with us. Hebrews tells us without the shedding of blood there, there is no forgiveness of sins. And this is why Jesus says during his last meal with his disciples the cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This new covenant that Jeremiah prophesies about, this is it. What we are about to partake of, that is the new covenant that Jeremiah prophesied. This is the promise that God made and he's kept for us in Jesus Christ. So think about the church for a second. As a church... We agree to covenant together. This is a covenant that you might say exists because of the ultimate one that we celebrate. Because we celebrate Jesus, and Jesus is the new covenant. It doesn't cover what we believe. It's really not really what we believe so much as how we agree to live together as followers of Jesus. It's a recognition that our life together as a community, as a community of believers, we reflect what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. That's how we are a covenant church. We agree to worship together. We agree that we are here because of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. That is our covenant. We fail each other sometimes, don't we? Well, many times we fail God too. But the covenant still stands. God still holds on to us. He still loves us. We are a community that is formed in the image of Jesus. So in conclusion, my prayer for us today is that while we remember the unconditional love that brought us here, that we also should remember what we ought to look like. My prayer is that the love shown to us will also be the love that we show to each other. 
My prayer is that the forgiveness that we have received will be the forgiveness that we give to others around us. My prayer is that the sacrifice that was made by Jesus our Lord on behalf of us would translate into our lives as sacrificial living and service for the Lord and for each other. My prayer is that the Lord is also saying to us what he said here in Psalm 132, verses 14 through 16. It says, This is my resting place forever and ever. Here will I sit enthroned, for I have desired it. I will bless her with abundant provisions. Her poor I will satisfy with food. I will clothe her priests with salvation and her faithful people with ever singing for joy. Amen. I hope that that is your prayer also. Let us pray.